Well, thank you all so much for um, joining me. Um, so I'm Hillary with the Chelan Douglas Land Trust, and I'm super excited that you're all joining us today. We're gonna have a really good exploration of local salamanders with um, our expert, Torsten Watkins. Um, some of you might remember that last year we held this event at the very end of February, um, right when we were starting to realize what it meant to all gather in a big group. Um, and so this year we didn't want to stop our tradition of having a late winter um, social event, but obviously we're doing it online. So thank you all for joining us for um, this online speaker series. Um, like I said, this is a speaker series. So this week we're going to be talking about salamanders with Torsten and next week we'll be learning everything um, we ever wanted to know about salmon with Tracy Bowerman. Um, and then the week after that, we'll be learning about our local living soil crusts um, and how we can bring them back with Lydia Bailey. So I hope that you all can return and join us for those as well. Um, so before I introduce Torsten, I wanted to thank all of our wonderful members who are joining us today. Um, so if you're a member, would you do me a favor and just like wave at the camera? Um, I just wanna see everybody. Yay, hi, thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, if you have your camera on, I can see you all waving. Uh, it's good to see you all. Uh, so I just wanna thank you. Like I said, um, it's just, it's only because of you guys that the Land Trust is here today and can do the work of caring for the land and the water and the trails. Um, because of you, you know, we have Saddle Rock and Castle Rock and Sage Hills and Horse Lake and all of the places that I can't even name because there are just too many that have been um, protected for for the people to explore and for local wildlife and flowers and so um, I just really appreciate that and you're also protecting our local waterways and um, our forested areas like mountain homes so that they can clean our water and provide homes for the salamanders that we're going to talk about today so thank you all so much for um, your support and um, if you're not a member uh, this is my plug come join us. <laughs> we have events um, like these and um, lots of, you know, once it's safe together, we have hikes and outings. Um, and there's always lots of ways to get involved through volunteering. I know um, our stewardship and trails crew are already um, getting the word out about some volunteer opportunities this spring. Um, and also our members are the first to hear about like, new con conservation news and new projects in our valley. So I think Kathy will put a link in the chat. Um, to, for anybody who's interested in becoming a member if you're not already. Um, and I've noticed a lot of people lately are joining um, with like a five or $10 a month gift, which I think is a wonderful new trend and um, is a great way to fit it into your budget. So I am glad to see that. And thank you all so much for joining us. Um, so uh, just a few technical details. We have a lot of people joining us right now. We're up to 71. We actually have over a hundred people signed up um, and we're gonna keep everybody on mute um, just to reduce chaos. <laughs> um, and if you click on your view options, which is up in the top right-hand corner, um, you'll find speaker view, which is probably the best view for this event. Um, in fact, I will uh, spotlight myself so that I am your, your, I think you're automatically in speaker view now. Um, also, you'll probably wanna turn your camera off when the presentation starts just to keep distractions to a minimum. And finally, if you have any questions for the speaker, please put them in the chat box, which is found in the lower bar. Um, and I'll be keeping an eye on that and make sure that questions get asked at the end. You can ask them publicly or privately just to me if you'd prefer. Um, and yeah, I would like to now introduce our speaker, um, Torsten. Um, Torsten is 14 and he's been studying reptiles and amphibians, which is a, a practice known as herpetology for five years. He's written a field guide to the reptiles and amphibians of Chelan County and has worked with CDLT, Wenatchee Valley College, North Central Regional Library and others to further knowledge of herpetology in our area. Um, you can visit his YouTube channel and I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Eridophore, um, for more herp herpetofaunal education. Um, welcome, Torsten, and thank you so much for, um, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yay. 
Um, so Torsten is going to stick around afterwards for a live Q&A. Um, but for now, I will get started on his presentation. And actually, I see there's there might be a question in the chat for me. Um, oh, um, Tristan, I will once I get started with the presentation, I will um, maybe check in with you and see if there's something I can do to help you get your sound started. But um, for now, why don't we get started with the presentation? Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my presentation on the salamanders of central Washington. Salamanders are a diverse group of animals. They come in many different shapes and forms, from salamanders that are as small as quarters to salamanders that are as big as people, salamanders that have no lungs, and salamanders that have projectile tongues. Uh, salamanders are truly fascinating animals. Um, even though they may not have as many species as frogs do, with frogs having over 7,000 species and salamanders having 800 species, they still, in my opinion, warrant a lot more recognition than they do currently now, but it probably is because of their secretive habits. In this presentation, we'll be looking at how to identify each species of salamander in our area, um, how they're distributed in our area, the different habitats that they uh, inhabit, and uh, interesting behaviors that they may exhibit. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Thorson Watkins. I'm a freshman at Wenatchee High School, uh, and I've been interested in animals for pretty much my whole life, but I've been increasingly interested in reptiles and amphibians, or what's called the study of herpetology, for the past few years now. And I really started to get interested when I learned more about the different species and how they interacted with each other. And I made it a goal to find as many as I could. Um, salamanders, though, prove proved a challenge to me when I was trying to find them. Um, and I think that's where my passion for them really started to begin. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, they're definitely some of my favorites. Uh, on the left here is a picture of me um, taking a photo of a Western fin lizard um, near Saddle Rock a while back. And this one's more recent uh, of me um, when I went looking for Larchmont salamanders. I didn't have any luck though, because they are quite a rare, rare species. Um, now we can get into the salamanders. Um, you may be asking why are salamanders important? Uh, salamanders are very beneficial to how ecosystems run. Um, salamanders um, fuel ecosystems by basically when they eat the insects lower on the food chain, that energy um, will travel up the food chain when a predator eats a salamander. Um, salamanders also uh, keep prey in check their populations in check and um, alter how their um, ecology works. And um, salamanders are also good bioindicators, which a bioindicator is basically a species that indicates whether an ecosystem or a habitat is healthy or not. And salamanders are especially good for this just because of how sensitive they are to small changes in the environment. Uh, first species we'll be taking a look at today is the long-toed salamander. Uh, these salamanders are um, named after the fact that they have longer toes than usual. Uh, in the corner here, I have an illustration that compares the toes or the hind feet of a long-toed salamander and it's relative the Western tiger salamander. As you can see, they do have slightly longer toes. Um, long-toed salamanders are pretty averagely sized salamanders reaching sizes of around five inches. And um, they have a dark background uh, with a yellow stripe that runs from their head to the tips of their tails. But this stripe is pretty variable uh, across different individuals. And there's a picture that of some of the variation I've seen at one population. Uh, Long-toed salamanders are distributed throughout most of um, our area in pretty much every single habitat besides desert areas lacking water and um, high up in mountains. Um, some of the habitats they doing, um, some of the habitats that they do inhabit uh, include sagebrush communities, woodlands, forests, urban areas, and uh, actually an easy way to look for them is to check uh, your irrigation um, boxes uh, where they like to hide in the damp and the dark conditions that provides for them. Um, 
some other things that they like to hide under are rocks and logs. And under this rock specifically, I found a large female long-toed salamander right before breeding season. Um, long-toed salamanders and other salamanders in general are usually secretive animals and are nocturnal because most of them don't have defense um, against predators. And so being nocturnal and avoiding uh, being surface active during the day it definitely helps them uh, survive. Um, during the beginning of early spring, the uh, once when the snow starts to melt, um, the long-toed sal salamanders start to migrate to their uh, breeding ponds, which can just be ponds or lakes. Um, and um, salamander courtship usually involves like intricate dances between the male and uh, female salamanders. And um, once when that process is all over, the females will lay their eggs onto grass, um, stems and logs and other stuff like that. And um, over a few weeks, the eggs will hatch into aquatic larvae, which are the aquatic stage in a salamander's life, uh, which over the course of a few months will lose its gills and uh, go into a terrestrial form. Um, Long-toed salamanders generally are pretty uh, safe when it comes to conservation. However, introduced predatory fish like trout um, do eat the, their larva, which can affect populations. Um, the next species we'll be taking a look at today is a pretty big one. Uh, this one being the Western tiger salamander. Uh, this species can get up to 10 inches and sometimes even bigger. Um, they have a black background with usually a, a very pretty pattern of yellow bars and blotches. And um, the species also has a round blunt head with small eyes that is makes their um, appearance pretty characteristic. Um, this species is found throughout the eastern drier parts of our area and uh, they inhabit shrub step grasslands and sometimes even open woodland um, and one of the habitat requirements is that there is loose soil um, this is because they are in a uh, group called the bull salamanders which are characterized by the fact that a lot of them inhabit um, underground for most of their lives um, and in tiger salamanders they can dig their own burrows uh, and sometimes they inhabit mammal burrows uh, that other mammals have dug out. And they spend most of their time under these, um, usually only coming out um, during raining, uh, when it's raining, to forage above ground. Uh, here's a picture of what's called tail lashing. And um, this is found in tiger salamanders and also long-toed salamanders and a few other species that we'll be covering. And um, Basically, they wave their tails around in front of predators um, and release a, um, a sticky white poison, um, which isn't that um, big of a deal for humans. But uh, yeah, um, tiger salamanders uh, start to migrate once when the snow is melted, starting to rain. They start to migrate to their ponds and um, after they court, the females will lay usually single or small clumps of eggs, which will once again hatch into aquatic larvae. Um, these ones usually taking a little longer to turn into terrestrial forms. They're also pretty large too. Um, our next species is even bigger than the long or the tiger salamander. Um, this one being the coastal giant salamander. Uh, this species can reach up to sizes of 13 inches. Um, they don't always get this big though. And um, so I, I haven't seen any of this large before. Um, this is probably one of my favorite species just because of how pretty they are, in my opinion. Uh, they have a brown background, which is sometimes even be golden, uh, overlain by a beautiful pattern of uh, brown blotches and uh, marbling. Uh, they inhabit the Western forested part of our area. They have a pretty interesting habitat preference, being found in clear forested rocky streams um, that have little or no silt. Um, and uh, yeah, the male, the um, the adults of this species usually inhabit just the general vicinity of these streams and only go down into them during breeding season. During the nighttime, they uh, come out and forage during rainy nights 
for uh, usually pretty large prey such as insects, worms, small amphibians, and even mice. During usually the spring and fall, uh, the males and females will court in the streams and the females will actually lay their eggs under rocks um, where they will protect them until they hatch. And what's pretty interesting about um, giant salamander larva is that it takes them a few years to actually turn into terrestrial forms. Sometimes they don't even turn into terrestrial forms at all, and they stay in a larval state. Um, this is called neoteny. Um, in this picture, I have a uh, coastal giant salamander that's just about to metamorphosize, is the word, into a terrestrial form. And it also kind of goes to show you how large they can actually get, because this one isn't even fully grown yet. Um, one of the main problems that concerns these species is uh, logging activities, which silt up the streams that they live in. Um, and this usually disrupts populations. Uh, they're also a lot more common in areas that have uh, an old growth forest canopy. Uh, the next species is the uh, rough skin newt. These guys are actually poisonous. Um, they have an under a very vibrant orange underside, uh, which is an example of what's called um, aposematic coloration, which is a type of coloration used to warn predators um, that they are poisonous and um, that they shouldn't eat them. Uh, aposematic coloration is also found in uh, dart frogs. Um, along with that, rough skin newts have rough and warty skin and uh, a brown kind of dark uh, upper side. Uh, along with, they, they share a similar range with the giant salamanders being found in forested areas in the Western part. Um, yeah, so they inhabit forests, usually near ponds and lakes where they breed. Um, and due to their um, poison actually, they are able to be active during the day because unlike other salamanders that have to be careful about predators, these guys don't have to worry about predators at all, um, pretty much. Uh, they actually share the same toxin as pufferfish do. Uh, it's called tetrodotoxin. And in humans, it can cause paral paralysis and um, death. But you shouldn't be worried about that as long as you wash your hands uh, after you hold them. As long as you aren't eating them, you should be fine. Um, Garter snakes have actually adapted to their poison. Um, in uh, response to this, rough skin newts have made their poison more toxic, um, but garter snakes just adapt to that. And it's kind of a back and forth um, race between them. During the um, spring, uh, rough skin newts will travel very far distances um, to their breeding ponds. Um, like very far distances, uh, which this actually does pose a threat to them uh, when it comes to roadways. Um, yeah, once when they get to their ponds, they, uh, the males actually develop smooth skin in response to becoming aquatic. Um, and they also develop rougher uh, toes and hands to grasp onto females. Um, yeah, after they've courted, the females will lay singular eggs on aquatic vegetation and just in the lake, and they will also hatch into aquatic larvae. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, the um, roadways do pose a problem to rough skin newts just because of how they migrate. Um, and a lot of them are killed this way, but it they are pretty safe when it comes to conservation. They're least concerned. Oh, the next species, is uh, the Organizatina. Uh, these guys have a very interesting name, um, which we'll get on to a little bit later. Um, they have a generally tan, uh, pinkish coloration. Uh, they have large, dark eyes, uh, which are pretty characteristic. Uh, they have a constricted tail base and uh, orange base, uh, orange coloration at the base of their limbs. Um, these are pretty small salamanders, um, usually less than five inches. Uh, these guys are found in the southwestern part of our area, kind of in the Klee Elm area. 
Uh, they can be found in forested areas, in logs, rocks, talus, and they like to inhabit the underground channels of like roots and mice uh, tunnels. Um, here's a picture of a defensive posture, which is pretty similar to tail lashing, where they will curl up and uh, secrete a poison. Um, and one of the, uh, the name Incitina uh, means sword-like. And this could be in reference to how they wave their tails, um, I guess in a fashion like swords. Um, Incitinas start to breed in spring. Um, after they court, uh, the females will, similarly to giant salamanders, will lay their eggs in pretty secluded areas where they'll protect them until they hatch. Um, our last species is the large mount salamander. These guys are one of my personal favorites and are um, pretty, they're pretty pretty. <laughs> um, they have a generally brown background overlaid by a uh, orange or yellow stripe that runs from their head to the tip of their tails. This stripe's usually uneven uh, and has a lot of different inconsistencies in it. Uh, these are very small salamanders, rarely reaching sizes above three inches. And they have a pink belly along with a short outer toe, which you can see in the illustration there. Um, these guys have also a similar range to Incitinas being found uh, all the way up to Snoqualmie Pass and Cleon. Um, they have a very interesting habitat preference being found in talus slopes where it provides a damp microhabitat for them. Um, large mount salamanders are actually part of a group called the lungless salamanders, which um, are characterized by having no lungs. Uh, Incitinas are also included in this group. Um, and instead of breathing through lungs, they breathe through their skin. And so in order to breathe through their skin, they have to keep it um, wet. And so living in these uh, damp talus slopes helps them uh, breathe. And when it gets drier in the summer, they just retreat deeper into the talus where it still is wet. Um, not much else is known about them uh, when it comes to like courtship. Um, they do eat uh, springtails, spiders, and other small bugs like that. Um, but yeah, not much is known about them just because of their secret to habits. Um, as far as conservation goes, they are threatened by roadways. Um, or the construction of roadways uh, because of the destruction of talus. Uh, however, a good sign for them is that uh, they have been shown to live in man-made talus slopes. So if worse comes to worse, then uh, we could always make new habitat for them. Uh, some extra species that I decided not to include fully just because they didn't really inhabit um, that large of an area in our area are uh, the Western Redback Salamander, which um, inhabits North Cascades, pretty isolated area, um, wet coniferous forests. Uh, other than that, they're pretty average lungless salamanders, really related to large mountain salamanders. Northwestern salamanders uh, are, they inhabit by Snoqualmie Pass pretty much. Uh, they actually have a very interesting um, symbiotic relationship with a species of algae, um, which when they lay their eggs, uh, the algae will inhabit the eggs and provide oxygen for them. Um, but yeah, that's it for the species. Um, a little tips to find salamanders are to search under rocks and logs in forests and by um, breeding ponds and lakes, especially during early spring. Uh, so it's definitely coming up to salamander season. Uh, another good way is when there is larva in the ponds, you can observe them, you can net them uh, if you want. Um, and another good way is to look for nocturnal species is to hike on rainy nights uh, when they will forage for their prey. Uh, in summary, salamanders come in a lot of different shapes and forms and they're very important to the ecosystem. Um, many face conservation threats and uh, it is our job to help them survive so that the um, rest of the ecosystem can remain stable. Uh, but yeah, that is about it for my presentation. Uh, thanks for joining me.
Thank you so much, Torsten, for sharing all of that wonderful knowledge with us. Um, appreciate having you here. Um, we've got a ton of questions. Uh, ooh, and someone just asked a question that I know is going to be asked again. So um, yeah, we have a lot of questions. People are really curious about salamanders. So you have a bunch of questions to look forward to. So the first question um, that I wanted to ask is, uh, so what's the difference between a newt and a salamander? So newts and salamanders, it's kind of the same case with uh, toads and frogs. Um, newts are a specific group of salamanders um, that are usually characterized by rough and warty skin, but that isn't in all cases. But kind of like with frogs and toads, it, the name is used like interchangeably between different species. So. Cool, so it's kind of like whatever sounds better. <laughs> But it mainly does apply to like a specific group of them. Okay. Um, so people had questions about like specific salamanders. Um, so one of them, one of the questions was like, um, oh, well, Sh Shelly just asked. Um, so I noticed you were wearing gloves in one photo. So if, if I find a salamander, what do you do? Do you recommend wearing gloves when handling them? Like how do we handle salamanders if we do run into them? So uh, usually when you do look for salamanders, it is best to um, wear gloves just because uh, certain oils in your skin can uh, dry and also like contaminants, like certain like stuff and like lotions and stuff. Um, so yeah, it is best to wear gloves. Cool. Um, so let's see. If someone wanted to see a giant salamander, which that was, if we can remember, that's the one that's sort of like a, a brown color with lighter brown spots. That's yeah. the really pretty one. Where, where, like, where would they go? Like, what part, like, what, I don't know, what trail or what area would they go to to try and see one? Uh, well, usually um, Lake Wenatchee is a good place that I like to go to, just kind of like the streams in that area. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, I had a local teacher who wants to know where she can get your field guide um, to the reptiles and amphibians that we mentioned at the beginning. Oh yeah, so there's a link of that on um, the Wenatchee Naturalist website and it might be uh, somewhere like on the regional library website too, but yeah. Okay. And I, I think I will probably um, send everybody a link to that afterwards because you sent it to me before. Oh, and Kathy, Kathy just put it in the chat too. Um, yeah, you sent it to me before this, um, before today, and I was looking through it. It was like really helpful um, and very detailed. So um, cool, thanks. Um, let's see, someone wants to know, like what is the evolutionary history of salamanders? Like what, what ecological niche do they fill, I guess? What do they uh, do that everything else doesn't? <laughs> Uh, salamanders have been like around for like millions of years pretty much um and like in the past they've filled they've like swam in the oceans and stuff um but modern amphibians um usually stick to like um you know forests and uh stuff like that. yeah yeah there's a lot more of a variety and diversity of salamanders um in the past oh, okay so they're kind of they're declining a little bit uh, not necessarily declining. Um, their diversity isn't as much as it used to be. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. I know, so someone asks, I know toads navigate using moisture. How do salamanders navigate? Did you mention that a little bit during, you mentioned um, using the stars? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I mentioned that or not. Uh, yeah, I think um, newts do use uh, certain like, um solar stuff and like as you're saying like stars to navigate um to find their breeding ponds pretty effectively actually they could travel really far yeah yeah is there anything else that they use to navigate uh they also use uh chemical cues um like uh chemical trails that other salamanders have left behind and themselves have left behind they'll follow those um, how about, let's see, what's another question? Um, you, I think you kind of mentioned this with the rough skin newts, um, but I was wondering if there's any other, like do any of these species have big nights where they migrate in mass to breeding pools? 
Uh, yeah, usually um, when rains have come, um, they will kind of over like the course of a few weeks, like some of them will go, but there is usually like a few big nights that most of them will migrate to when the conditions are right. Is that mostly like if there's enough, enough moisture to keep them? Yeah, warm and rainy nights around this time of year. Okay. It's definitely coming this season. So we should be careful when we're driving is what I'm hearing. Yeah, it's mainly at night, but. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, will tiger salamanders breed in vernal pools or only in permanent bodies of water? Um, so because tiger salamanders do inhabit like drier habitats, usually most of the water sources they breed in are temporary, but they will breed in uh, permanent water sources too. Uh, usually ones that lack fish though, because um, like long toed salamanders, so fish will feed on their larva. Oh, okay. So if there's fish in a pond, like if, if fish get introduced to a pond, does that have an impact on the salamander population? Yeah, it does. Okay. Um, cool. Um, Oh, I had, um, before this started, someone emailed me with a question because he um, usually finds, um, well, every year in his irrigation boxes in Wenatchee, he finds Eastern long-toed salamanders, which I think you mentioned that those are, it's common to find them in there. Um, but he, he can't figure out any way that they can get out. And every year there's new baby salamanders in his irrigation box. And he's like wondering like, how like how do they exist in there so so one of some of his questions were like do they have to have like a water source because there isn't water in there so like his actual question is do they absorb water through their skin or do they drink dew like how do they how do you think they're getting their water in there i think most of the um most of the time they usually absorb like moisture through their skin um and then also like uh, mucus they secrete helps them retain that moisture um, the reason why they can stay in irrigation boxes is because there is like, it's damp and cool and, um, has a lot of moisture in the first place usually, because it's usually protected from the sun. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you have like a little bit of a leak, I know I have leaks in my irrigation boxes. It's probably <laughs> why they can live in there. Um, uh, he also wants to know, like, can they be bred in captivity? Uh, yes, yeah, salamanders can be bred in captivity. Um, Depends on species to species. Some species are a lot harder to breed than others just because some of them have specific conditions that they need to have. But yeah, they can be bred in captivity. Is there, are there, is there like one kind of salamander that people tend to keep as a pet? Is, like, is, is there a pet? Do people have pet salamanders? Uh, yeah, I think um, tiger salamanders are actually pretty popular, at least, um, yeah. Huh. Cool. Um. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then how, how do you tell the sex of a salamander? Can you? Uh, yeah, you can. Um, usually, um, well, in the tiger salamanders and long toed salamanders, um, so it's called a cloaca. That's pretty much the equivalent to a butt. Mm -hmm. It's right below their tails. Um, but in males, that will usually have a bulge. And the males, I think, also have, um, longer tails. Oh, okay. And some of them, do some of them like look different? Like are the males, do they look, is it only looking at the cloaca? Is that the only way? Uh, it's not necessarily the only way, um, but I don't think, well, I think you're talking about uh, what's called sexual dimorphism. With yeah. like females having different colors. I don't think any of the salamanders in our area have that kind of coloration. Those were all the questions that came in earlier. And I know there's a bunch more coming in to the chat. So let me, let me double check that I didn't miss any. Okay, now I'm gonna go to the chat. Oh, a bunch of people are really interested in your collaboration with the Burke Museum. So if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I've been um, talking with um, the professor, uh, Adam Liash, Lee, I don't know how to pronounce the last name. He's actually in the um, Zoom right now. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, we've been talking about like some projects that aren't necessarily official. Um, yeah, cool. like um, one of them's about salamanders, one of them about is uh, a specific species of snake in Leavenworth. Um, yeah. I wanna know all about that. Is there anything else you can share right now? <laughs> I mean, like, none of it's really like official that it's gonna happen. Uh, Fine, yeah. I'll, be, I'll be patient. 
<laughs> um, let's see. Um, what is the life expectancy of a salamander? Um, I think tiger salamanders have been known to actually live up to 10 years, I think, or more than 10 years, maybe. Um, but besides that, I think a lot of the information on life expectancy is based off of in captivity. Um, so in the wild, it's not really known. It's probably less than a ca in captivity because there is like natural factors that can kill them off. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably hard to tag a salamander, I would assume. Well, there is actually um, different ways you can. There's like these little um, plastic tags that you can put or insert into their legs. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also like other forms. But yeah, it's not necessarily hard. There's just different methods depending on how like big they are. Um, someone wants to know if all or most of the species that you talked about today, are they mostly found east of the Cascades or are some also found in the Puget Sound area? Um, well, so some of them are found in the Puget Sound area, uh, like long-toed salamanders um, and coastal giant salamanders. Um, but because it's in, it's, it's mainly west of the Cascades, but I, I mean, east of the Cascades. But I know that um, like Western Chelan County and Western Kittitas County like are in the Cascades. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. They probably have a lot in common. Like there's like that transition zone. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. Someone asks, um, well, Stephanie Bender says that she lives in Olympia and she's pulling ivy out of her yard and she finds a lot of salamanders and is worried about disturbing their safe habitat. But of course, ivy is invasive. And so is there something I can do to help them while still pulling out the ivy? I actually uh, don't know about that one because um, I don't know how much they utilize ivy. Mm -hmm. um, I guess if it is, I, I don't think it would be that big of a deal, um, especially if uh, ivy competes with native plants, um, then I think it would be better to just take the ivy out mm -hmm. um, so that there isn't like more damage in yeah. general. So what if she wanted to like, like if someone wanted to encourage salamanders in their backyard, like what could you do? Um, you could, um, well, it's usually best if you're like out closer to the edge of wilderness and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I know some people like in the suburbs can find long-toed salamanders in their irrigation. But um, a good way is to like set out uh, like rocks or just different cover objects that you can place on the ground um, that they can utilize uh, as cover. Cool. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, someone asked, uh, Stephanie also asked like providing an indoor or outdoor habitat for them. Like if I set aside some of my yard and closed it in, but I think you, you answered that like, yeah. Um, there's so many questions. <laughs> um, so how many miles will they travel when they do travel really far? Um, a lot of the, uh, the data that I've seen is in kilometers. So, uh, yeah. You can say it in kilometers, we can figure it's like 0. 0.6 or 0.6 miles, I forget. Yeah, um, I do know, um, I, I wouldn't be able to say like the exact numbers, but um, they can travel, I, I'd say they probably could travel a few miles. Cool. Um, it probably depends on like the size. Of yeah, it also depends on the salamander too, or how far they're like placed away. Yeah. How far they disperse. Um, do are ducks predators of salamanders? Um, I mean they could be. I don't think I've ever seen that um anywhere. But yeah, I mean if I don't know much about the diet of ducks, but if there is like a carnivorous duck and it spots a salamander, might eat it. <laughs> I think so. a lot of salamanders are nocturnal, right? And a lot of ducks are diurnal, so probably they don't overlap that much. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Ooh. Let's see. Okay. So 
this one's a kind of a long question, but I'll ask it and we'll see. Um, you mentioned that forestry and timber sales can have a negative impact. Can you describe what structures they use within forest stand that would be worth protecting? Are there features or species of plants that can be left behind after a timber sale that would be more beneficial to salamanders? That's kind um, of very specific. <laughs> with um, giant salamanders, um, it's not necessarily the um, timber, like the chopping down of trees that necessarily affects them. It's the silt that goes into their streams um, that affects the um, density of like larval populations. Um, and I think with larch mountain salamanders, um, if um, the canopy is like destroyed in a way, um, that probably does affect moisture. But I do know that um, with larch mountain salamanders, they have been shown to um, inhabit man-made talus slopes. So if there is like populations that um, are in decline, um, we can create new habitat for them. Um, yeah, I guess if there's species of plants that react negatively, um, like the understory and stuff, um, then that definitely, that probably would affect them. Yeah. Um, so someone wants to know, so, so we've been talking about you going to identify salamanders and collecting salamanders and looking at them, um, but you also, you have a permit, is that right? To, to do sort of collection and things like that? Um, uh, yeah, I do have a permit um, under the Schlein Douglas County Land Trust. Okay. Um, so, so they wanted to know like why, what's the importance of the permit and why, why, collect, why is collecting live animals to take home not allowed? Uh, it's not allowed probably um, because of the fact that um, if, everybody were to go and like collect a bunch of salamanders for themselves, then that would end up being a lot of salamanders um, lost from like the actual ecosystem. So I think it just prevents people from taking too many salamanders um, and instead having people who actually um, have like a, a use for taking those salamanders rather than just people taking them. Yeah. So it's mostly for for researchers and for people who are d like doing wildlife work and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone wants to know what the largest salamander on Earth is. Uh, the largest salamander on Earth is uh, the Chinese giant salamander. Um, and they're actually related to our giant salamanders. Um, they're very ancient lineage of salamanders. Um, found in Asia, they get up to like six feet long. It, it's crazy. That's huge. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So they're, they're related to our giant salamanders here in the Northwest? Uh, no, so they aren't. Oh. Um, yeah. um, and then I have a lot of people just saying, thank you so much and we're so lucky to have you. Um, I know we're getting to the end of it. Oh, one more question. Um, are any of the salamanders in our area threatened or endangered? Uh, so the large mountain salamander is um, considered threatened by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife just because of the fact that it has a very specific habitat preference and they occur in very isolated um, populations so they could easily be wiped out. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's why they're, they are threatened, those ones. I, I think that's the only threatened species we have in our area. Yeah, I know there's probably, there, there isn't that much, I feel like rep, or amphibians in general don't get as much love when it comes to research. And so I wonder if like, if we knew more about our salamanders, maybe more of them would be threatened. Yeah, maybe. Um, well, that, I think that's, I have one um, picture of a salamander that um, someone wants you to identify, but I don't think I can figure out how to do that on Zoom very easily. So, and it is 6.45 and I want to be respectful of your time and everybody else's time because you probably have school in the morning. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I just wanted to thank you so much for being willing to do this and, and do your presentation, put all that work into it and then answer everybody's questions. Um, 
as we can see, people are super, I, I feel like people just don't know that much about salamanders. So thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah. Yeah, so I think if, um, if people want to stick around for a couple more minutes, if you have more questions, you're welcome to do that and ask in the chat. Um, but other than that, I think we're done for the evening and I hope that you all come back and join us for um, the next week, which is everything you ever wanted to know about salmon with um, Tracy Bowerman, who I think was here tonight too. So uh, that one's super fun. Um, we recorded it a couple of days ago and I'm really excited to share that with you as well. Um, but thank you all so much for, for coming. Um, thank you. I love it. People are saying thanks in the chat. I don't know if you, you can see that, Torsten. Yeah, yeah. Yay. Thank you all so much. Oh, um, someone wants to know, Torsten, what are you what are you studying or what are you planning to study in college? Um probably well, I want to get like some sort of like degree in biology, probably. Um yeah. I hope you do. I feel like we'll we'll learn so much <laughs> from that extra um, education. Yeah, and a bunch of people just saying thank you. So I think we'll uh, we'll end it here and say um, say good night. Oh, um, you're so Adam is asking if he would be able to unmute and. Let's see, I think I can, now that people are, are heading out, um, I can probably, since it's passed. Um, I think if I do that, then everybody's gonna be asked to unmute. <laughs> um, should I try that? What do you think, Torsten? Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> okay, well, so if you're around, now you are able to unmute and we can all just chat since it's the end of it. and. Um, Thanks, Hillary. That was great. I'm glad you invited <laughs> us. I wanted to say, Torsten, that was a great talk, and it's nice to meet you. This is Adam Lachey here. I know my name looks crazy. It looks like Leech or something. It's pronounced yeah. Lachey, but it's nice to finally meet you face to face. Yeah. Have you guys been, not actually like even Zoomed together? No, we've been emailing for a long time, though. Okay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, oh, Mar uh, somebody... Um, yeah, Margie, are you there? Do you want to pop on? Yeah. Oh, I have horrible lighting though. Hang on. <laughs> I'm spin my computer. Oh, and that's just as bad. All right. This is um, from the the fish hatchery and she works for the fish hatchery in Leavenworth. Yeah. So I work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm a park ranger. And um, this past winter, I've been working with the Woodland Park Zoo. Uh, they have this really cool citizen science amphibian monitoring program that they've been doing with WDFW and volunteers for the last eight years. And this year is the first year that we're gonna have three monitoring sites on the east side of the mountains. So um, I'm doing a site in Leavenworth and then Joyce Block, the one of the biology teachers at Wenatchee High School is gonna have a site in Kashmir with uh, one of her classes. And then Chelsea Trout up at Okanagan High School is also gonna be monitoring a site with one of her classes. So if there's any amphibian enthusiasts out there who want to get in on this monitoring project or um, you know, it, it might be a little bit late to add new sites this year, but if you're interested in learning more about the program and getting involved um, either this season or next year's season, um, I guess I can, I'll pop my email into the chat bar and you can get in touch with me. Um, and Torsten, I don't know if you'd be free to come out to any of the site monitorings or, or if you'd be interested. We're mostly looking for um, egg masses and uh, larvae at this point in time, um, which I'm not very confident in my identification skills of. But if, if you wanted to come out and check it out, we'd, we'd love to have you. I'd love to come to one of those. Yeah, no, okay, awesome. I'll let you know. I think Okanagan High School might be a little hard to uh, get to, but I'll definitely let you know what I'm coordinating with uh, Joyce Block's classes at Wenatchee High School. Are you, Torsten, are you in middle school or in high school this year? Oh, I'm in high school. I'm a freshman. You're in high school. Oh, okay. So are you at uh, Wenatchee or East Wenatchee? Um, I'm in Wenatchee. Okay, you should definitely take some classes with Joyce. I mean, there's a lot of great biology teachers, but Joyce Block has the best field trips. So you should, uh, you should take some classes with her if you can. All right, so I'll just put... Sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say, I'm just going to put my email into the chat box if anyone wants to get in on this fun amphibian monitoring project. Yeah, actually, Margie, I will, I will grab your email and because I'm going to send out a follow up email tomorrow with like links to um, Torsten's YouTube and the field guide that he made and everything. So I can stick that in there as well. Um, you're muted. <laughs> oh, here. Unmute. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm so bad at technology. Um, I was just also going to share the website, uh, the Woodland Park Zoo website, with some more information about the program. If yeah, folks want to look great. at that, and you can put that in the email too. Cool. Okay. Well, I know it's nothing like getting together at Pibus for appetizers and drinks and. It is so good to see you. And it's super fun to be able to like dive in a little bit deeper into the topics um, this year rather than other years. But I think, uh, I think I'm gonna head out. So I think as soon as I do, you guys are all gonna get kicked off, but it was so good to see everybody. So, and thank you again, Torsten. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks. Torsten.